This series of presentations covers the subject of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And uh, this one, number three, focuses on the book of Leviticus. Leviticus gets its name from one of the 12 tribes that were descended from Abraham. The 12 tribes were named after the 12 sons of Jacob. One of those brothers was Levi, and from Levi descended the tribe of Levi, also known as the Levites. When the children of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, the Israelites, the Jews, succeeded in escaping from Egyptian slavery and actually got settled into the Promised Land, each of the 12 tribes received an allotment of territory, a certain area that they could call their own, uh, except for the tribe of Levi. The tribe of Levi did not get a land allotment because, uh, as God said, um, God is their portion, and their task was going to be different. They were not going to be farmers and shepherds. They were going to be priests. They were dedicated to the temple, and their job and the job of their sons and their grandsons would be to be temple workers, uh, priests, ministers, religious leaders, teachers. Um, that was the Levitical role. And the book of Levit Leviticus tells all about the details of this stuff, all about the religion of Israel, about uh, the laws, the rules, um, the law code, the moral standards, uh, the religious rules, the health principles, the rituals, all of that stuff, sacrifices, um, when, what, what kind of sacrifice was to be given and when, whether it was to be a lamb or a goat or a bull or a turtle dove, uh, the offerings, the holy days, the festivals, the rituals. It all seems very, very complicated as you read about it, but it had a very simple overarching theme, and that was it was a way for the people of Israel to connect with God and to take him seriously, to connect with God, but to connect with him in the right way. The main point here is that God really wants to dwell with his people. He wants to be a part of their lives. He wants to dwell with his people Israel and to be there among them. But the people need to understand who it is that they have dwelling in the midst of them, who God is. And uh, they need to understand that God is not like them, that he is holy and that he is different. And so um, all of the rituals and stuff that went along with Leviticus was designed to help the people to recognize the otherness of God and to approach him in the right way and uh, to receive from him what they needed in terms of salvation and forgiveness and redemption and connection and cleansing and new beginning, uh, but to be able to receive it from this God that they really didn't understand very well. The people of Israel were supposed to live differently than all the other nations of the earth lived because their God dwelt in their midst and their God was a high and holy God. He, didn't, uh, he wasn't the kind of God who uh, liked it when people got drunk and went on a wild religious rampage. He wasn't the kind of God who liked to be worshipped through prostitution in his temple. Um, he was the kind of God who was highly ethical, who was very... Um, loving and gracious, but at the same time uh, very clear about right and wrong. Um, and, and this whole distinction between what is good, what's bad, what's acceptable, what's unacceptable, what's clean, what's unclean, needed to be underlined continually. And the book of Leviticus was designed to make those points clear to the people by making them clear, first of all, to the priests who would teach them to the people. Um, one of the main elements in the book of Leviticus, not the only one, but a very instructive and illustrative element, is um, what it has to say about the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was a once-a-year festival that took place uh, at the temple, and all the people of Israel were supposed to gather together and come to the temple, to the sanctuary, whatever they had, whether a permanent temple or the temporary sanctuary, and they were to gather there for this multi-day festival. It was a solemn 
holiday. It was not the kind of thing that was, you know, a lot of um, hoopla. It was kind of solemn, sober, serious, more like Lent than uh, like Christmas or Easter. Um, it was a time for confession, a time where people quite literally would agree with God. That's what the word confession literally means, to agree with God, to say the same thing as God. Uh, they would confess their sins. They would uh, analyze their lives. They would look back over the past year and see how faithful they had been to God or not. And uh, they would seek God's forgiveness. Uh, a central element in the Day of Atonement Festival was the the uh, ceremony, the ritual of the scapegoat. You've probably heard the phrase, scapegoat. This is where it comes from. The scapegoat was a literal goat that... Um, would be brought before the priest, and the priest would uh, put his hands on the goat. He would lean his weight onto the goat, uh, you know, large man leaning on a small animal, and he would confess not only his sins, but all the sins of all the people of Israel onto the head of this goat. And then this goat would be taken out into the wilderness far, far away, where it would never be able to find its way back again, and it would be released there probably to die out in the wilderness. The theologians who have analyzed this and looked at it up and down say, yeah, this is, this is a great symbol of how ultimately uh, God is going to cleanse sin from every human being, from every human being's place. And all this sin is going to be sent out into the wilderness, you might say. And uh, not only that, but the devil who played a role in all of this is going to finally uh, get his just desserts for all that he has done. Uh, and become uh, the scapegoat for all the stuff that has taken place at his conniving. There were also, in the Festival of the Day of Atonement, the offerings of some sacrificial, other sacrificial animals, for example, the sacrificial bull. Um, uh, once again, uh, the bull was sacrificed, its blood was caught in a golden bowl. The priest now, the high priest, would do something remarkable. Uh, the temple was set up in such a way that any Jew could go into one courtyard. Only women, I'm sorry, only male Jews could go into the next courtyard. The women were forbidden. Only priests could go into the next compartment. Even males could not go in, only if they were priests. And in the final interior apartment, the Holy of Holies, or the most holy place, only the high priest could go, not even an ordinary priest. And the high priest could only go in there once a year. And when he went in, he had to be very careful to follow certain rituals. He had to go with blood. In this case, on the Day of Atonement, which was the one day of the year when he was allowed to go into the most holy place, he went in with this bowl of blood from the bowl, and he dipped his fingers into it as he came in, and he sprinkled it before him, uh, especially on the altar, which was the main furniture in the most holy place. This was the holy of holies, the place where God's presence dwelt. And uh, I imagine the high priest went in there kind of shaken in his shoes, except he was barefoot, and uh, wondering whether he was holy enough and pure enough to survive this encounter with the presence of God, and grateful that he had the blood of a bull, in a sense, to kind of prepare the way. Um, but this was the, the high point of the Day of Atonement, when the high priest, representing the people of Israel, appeared in the very presence of God, um, very carefully washed, very carefully scrubbed, very carefully with sacrifices and incense and all that kind of stuff, very carefully to appear at this one time of the year in the presence of God and to receive God's forgiveness for all the people and to come out of the sanctuary and to announce that forgiveness for all the people, that they had been forgiven, they'd been washed, they'd been cleansed, they were acceptable to God as his own chosen people. And this was a really, really big deal. It was a solemn moment. And uh, there was a certain amount of fearfulness about it all. And uh, by all of this, again, people were uh, helped to understand that while God is a God of great love and compassion and mercy, uh, he is also a holy God who can't just be approached in your flip-flops and cutoffs. You know, you've, you've got to come before him with a recognition of who he really is. Um, this whole book of Leviticus is just full of things to help us to understand what the relationship is like between God and us. That God is perfect, but we are very imperfect. 
God is love, but we, on the other hand, are selfish and egocentric and self-centered. God is holy, but we, unfortunately, are very unholy. So we are invited to come into the presence of God, to come close, to come right up onto his lap, but to do it with respect and to know that he's not only our father, but he's also the king of the universe, the holy one who inhabits eternity. And uh, the sanctuary, the temple was all designed to teach this stuff. The priesthood, the rituals, the book of Leviticus, all designed to help people understand what this was about.